the Buddha talks about our idea of self. He does it in a very practical way. The things we identify as us or ours are things that we have some control over. Your hand. If you want to raise it, it'll go up. You want to move it to the right, it goes to the right. To the left, it goes to the left. Sometimes. There'll come a time, though, when it won't do that. And this is why we have such a difficult relationship with the body and the other things that we claim as us and ours. Is figuring out when we can control them and when we can't. Because they change. And when they change, they don't ask permission. So while we have use of the body, while we have use of the mind, we should try to get the most important use out of these things. We can use the breath to gain concentration. And once we've gained concentration, then we can try to understand the parts of the body, the things the body does, against our will. Because as long as we identify with the body, we're in for a lot of trouble. So pain is one of the things we focus on, because we don't go jumping right into the pain, because nobody without the proper mental skills, can stay with it long enough to see it clearly. Because our usual response to pain is we want it to go away. Either we run away from it or we try to push it out of where we want to be. And occasionally we can do that, but a lot of times we can't. You want to be able to come at the pain from another perspective is that you want to understand it. So as part of the strategy is you go to another part of the body, the part that's not in pain. You learn to stay there. And it may seem like the pain is screaming at you, but that's actually a lot of layers of other things between you and the actual sensation. The sensation is just there. It's not doing anything. It doesn't have any intention toward you. But there are a lot of little sensors in the mind that say, well, there's a problem here. Something you've latched on to being yours and it's not the way you want it to be. And there's the warning signals that this could be dangerous, this could cause trouble down the line, you better take care of it right away. All the, all the lights have lit up. And for the time being, you have to learn how to ignore them. Because you need your foundation. You need a place where you feel at least relatively secure. Once there's that sense of ease with the pain, where you're not necessarily pulled into it, you're not there focused on the pain, but you learn how to let it have part of the body. In John Lee's images of a house with floorboards, some of which are rotten, and you're going to lie down on the floor. But you don't choose the rotten spots, you choose the good spots. And notice that you're lying on the floor. When we're working with the breath, sometimes we feel we want to make it really comfortable and full of rapture and all these wonderful things. And for some reason, it's just okay. We drive ourselves crazy trying to make it really good. But you have to remember, okay is okay. You're looking for a spot where you can settle down. That's kind of like Thailand dealing with Britain and France. You may not like the fact that there's a pain in a certain part of the body. You have to be willing to give up your possession of that part of the body, at least for the time being. Just like Thailand had to give up parts of Cambodia, parts of Burma, to maintain its independence. You can let the pain have that other part, the part where you're not focused. and you withdraw into a smaller area 
once that area is okay and you're okay staying there, then you can think of spreading some of that okay energy out in the direction of the pain and through the pain. Don't let the pain form a wall to the breath energy. Because remember, the breath energy is prior. Your sense of the body, your sense of what's going on in the body, is always filtered through the breath. And yet sometimes we get things backwards. We think if there's a pain or if there's a solid feeling of blockage someplace the breath can't go through. And then we breathe in that way, in a truncated kind of way. So you have to remind yourself, the breath is always going through the body all the way. And you want to be in touch with that level of breath energy. And keep that uppermost in your mind. What you're beginning to do is take an active role toward the pain instead of just being the passive recipient of the pain, putting yourself on the line of fire. You're now turning your awareness on it and you're getting a little bit more aggressive with the pain. Once you've worked with the breath, some kinds that makes a lot of the pain go away, at least it makes it a lot, more easy, <coughs> a lot easier to deal with. And when you're feeling confident enough, you can start probing into the pain, asking yourself questions about what shape is the pain. We have all kinds of crazy subconscious ideas about what pain is and how it's invaded the body. But your body sensations are one thing, and the pain sensations are something else. At the very least, don't put yourself in the position of being the the sail that re some, just getting the wind of the pain blown at you. Try to make your awareness small. And as I say in Thai, it doesn't eat the wind, it doesn't gather up the wind. The wind goes past, goes past, goes, goes past. If you want, you can think of yourself as watching the pain go away, go away, go away, as you're sitting in the back of a car with your back to the front facing the back, and you see the things going on past you on the side of the road. They're going away, away, away. You're not receiving them. You can ask yourself, is the pain a solid sensation, or are there little bits and pieces of sensations? There are lots of questions you can ask about the pain and your relationship to it. And that's the important thing, is you're questioning it, you're probing it. You're taking the active role here. You begin to question the ways you've been picturing the pain to yourself, because a lot of those things are the problem. I read a very strange article the other day, someone saying that perception is the least problematic of the different ways we identify with us, ourselves or our sense of self. Perceptions are neutral. They're not neutral. Perceptions come from our lizard brain, and they carry a lot of impact. And a lot of them stay underground. So what you want to do is learn how to bring them out from underground, question them. Some of the questions may seem strange, like I said, about the shape of the pain or which side of the pain are you on. Are you on the top or are you below it? Are you to the left or to the right? And when you ask that question, sometimes you find that the, the mind actually has a position, or it thinks it has a position with regard to the pain. It has lots of these assumptions that we've built over who knows how many years. It's only when you question them that you begin to realize that the power they have over you. And in realizing the power they have over you, free yourself from some of that power. That's the important part. It's by questioning the assumptions you begin to realize that they're pretty arbitrary. That a lot of the pain that you've been suffering from has to do with the way you relate to sensations. And even though the sensations in and of themselves may not be pleasant, you begin to realize that that fact does not have to weigh on the mind. This is important, this distinction we make between the stress and pain of the Four Noble Truths and the stress and pain of what they call the three characteristics. 
The second kind is the simple fact that we have bodies that have pains. It's a natural part of the physical processes and the mental processes by which we live. But there's another kind of pain that comes from clinging and craving. And that doesn't have to be there. That's the pain in the Four Noble Truths. And that's optional. In other words, it comes from our own unskillful habits. And it can be ended by learning how to be more skillful. And it turns out that that's the kind of pain that weighs the mind down. Because without the clinging and craving, the pains in the body have no impact on the mind at all. They're just there. It's part of nature. But the mind doesn't suffer. Now to see the distinction between those two kinds of suffering, you really do have to probe into the pain, and you have to come from a position where you feel secure in doing the probing. This is why you learn how to, to deal with the pain for a while, and then you realize that the mind is tired of analyzing things, tired of questioning things, and you go back to your center. Stay there and rest. Let the pain have its area. You go back and forth like this. But there have been many, many Ajahns who talked about how the really important things in their meditation, the really important moments in their meditation came from learning about pain, watching it. It's something we all want to run away from, but it's through dealing with the pain that we can break through to something really important. It's not like you're pushing through the pain, but the mind itself begins to sort things out. With John Furing, it was a headache. With John Sawat, it was a case of malaria. With John Mahabhu, it was sitting long, long hours in meditation. But in every case, it came from realizing that what the Buddha said in his very first sermon, pain is to be comprehended. It was one of the most important things he said. So keep this in mind when you encounter pain, and we all are going to encounter pain. If we're not encountering it now, it's, it's down the road. The Buddha said, you know, dukkha, pain, suffering, stress, is a noble truth. I read something else really strange recently saying that the fact that we're suffering is something to be ashamed of. It is very ignoble because it's a sign that we've been clinging and craving. It shows a lot of misunderstanding. It's noble in the sense that if you really follow the duty with regard to this truth, It opens you up to something really noble, a really noble attainment. And the truth itself is noble in the sense, this is peculiar to the language of the Buddhist time, that the word Arya also meant universal. Something that was standard, was true across the board. It wasn't just one person's personal opinion or something that was picked up from one culture but wasn't true in another culture. This is something true across the board. Everyone experiences pain, and we can get beyond it by comprehending it. And your willingness to face it is noble in and of itself. <laughs>